Um, good morning once again um, to, to those of you who are here with us today. Um, as always, on behalf of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in the UK, I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to this morning's webinar, um, which is on the topic of how artificial intelligence is changing the business landscape. Um, as a very quick disclaimer, this session is being recorded this morning. So we're delighted to be holding this webinar in collaboration with Chamber Patron Plain Concepts, which is a multinational um, developer-led technology, co technology company uh, with a focus on looking at how trends in technology can be used to simplify business processes. Um, they look at all aspects of IT, from structural such as cloud migration and security, to practical such as the way that data is collected, um, enriched into information, and then understood to become knowledge. Um, today we're joined by James Bando, um, who's the country lead for business development at Plain Concepts UK and focuses on building the, the Plain Concepts brand. James has a passion for information and uh, knowledge management, along with all um, new technology from robotics to the latest in AI. Um, following uh, James's presentation, there will be time for a Q&A session. Um, so throughout the duration of the talk, please do feel free to add any questions you might have to the Q&A function. It will either appear below on your screen or, or just above the, the shared screen um, from James. Um, and then uh, the questions will be addressed by James's colleague, Rodolfo, who has al also joined us this morning. Um, that's everything from my side. Uh, thank you for, for joining us, James. Over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rebecca. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope that I can impart some knowledge to the group. And as we've just said, any questions that you have, please feel free to put them into the box, and we'll be able to address them at the end of the presentation. As far as this presentation is concerned, um, I want it to be more of a theory of what AI is and how it all works, and then look at the business capabilities in some use cases that we have already established, um, and we'll take it from there. So we'll just start off with a little bit about plain concepts. I have a pretty much covered by Rebecca, so let me gloss over these slides. Plain concept, uh, we've been around for 17 years. We're officially almost old enough to drink, which is a good thing, um, because this is IT and you need to do that. Yeah, so we're focused predominantly on digital transformations that goes into your data, AI, analytics, et cetera. The part, point that I wanna bring across here is that information and technology, information technology is all focused on that information aspect. And what we've been doing since computers became an everyday tool in 95 odd and web was introduced, we began this process of gathering data, large amounts of data. And now we've got to look at that data and try and establish what we could actually potentially do with it. And that's where AI is starting to move to, it, the data enrichment. So our solution areas, as I said, I'm just going to gloss over here, but the presentation will be available later on. Some of our clients, uh, just so that you can see some of our pedigree, Ferraris, um, Acciona, where we've done an internet of things, bi-directional digital board. And what that's got the ability to do is pick up various sensors, process that information, and then control. So Acciona, as you know, do wind farms and um, solar farms. Where this helps, and in the AI component, which you'll see in a little bit, not specifically Acciona, but is the ability to ingest all of that data and information and then make use of it. So for example, looking at the speed of a wind turbine as it's going, if it's going too fast, looking at the weather pattern, which is coming at it to say that the wind is gonna keep, continue to go further and faster and faster, you would have to be predictive in your maintenance and predictive in the scenario to actually slow the blades down so that you don't damage the equipment. Various things like this. And because it's bi-directional, you don't necessarily have to have an actual person going out to do it if you've got the capabilities within the machine and the robotics that you are currently handling. But let's get on to uh, our partner ecosystem. Obviously, we work with various partners, AWS, Cisco, Microsoft, et cetera. Boston Dynamics, that's one of my favorites because I enjoy Spot the Dog. 
And also, if you've had a chance to look at the further robotics which they're producing, um, they've developed a robot that can now move objects, jump up and down. It's 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 fascinating to see where we're going to. It's not quite Terminator yet, but we're getting there. So, what is AI? Here we have to look at a definition. Okay, so AI is defined as the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. That all sounds very well and good, but let's break it down a little bit. So we want to look at what intelligence is, okay, the ability to acquire and acknowledge skills. What is artificial? So it's basically fake. So does that not mean that artificial intelligence is, in essence, faked intelligence? Which, if you look at what a lot of people are currently talking about and the progression of AI and the way that it's becoming more and more invasive within the IT space and just in general for people, and you've got certain of the key players who are saying that things need to be slowed down, um, et cetera, the question is, is it bad? Is it good? How will it affect us? in business and going forward and also in the theory of everything how will it affect people and mankind going forward because like everything there is a double-edged sword so on one side this is a brilliant concept and the ability to process that information and extrapolate data correctly is very strong it's something that you want to have but you don't want everything to be taken over and controlled seeded etc and that's where people are starting to look at things. But let's break it down to a more simplistic view of artificial intelligence. So for this, I use the definition of developmental psychology. So in psychology and the way that we develop as humans, and the reason that we're using this as a reference is because it's the same functionality that we have within the development of the brain and the way that everything acts or interacts. So you look at a baby as it's lying there in the crib, it learns by testing. So that's why they wiggle, they squeak, the leg kicks out, the hand moves. And at that time, what their brain function is doing is learning that if you fire off a certain series of neurons, you have a result. And as you keep on testing this result, so you can gauge further um, various requirements. So you learn that if you fire series A, B, C, your leg can move. If you learn that you fire D, E, F, you can make a sound come out of your mouth. If you make that sound come out of your mouth, you get food. All these various associations. That's crucial if you relate it back to AI and machine learning components. It's constantly testing out the information and how it all works and where it's going forward and where it's going to move to. And by learning and testing, AI starts to develop a type of knowledge database behind it at the end of the day this is all about the data once again as i said what we've been doing for the past 20 25 30 years is housing and protecting data so we've been gathering that knowledge now we need to learn from it we need to extrapolate the data and enrich it the interesting thing here is when you look at the development of schemas and the problem solving capabilities that come with that for example if I am hungry, I fire off nerves, I make a sound, I get food. Same scenario happens within AI. So in a test environment that was created by Microsoft, they had two objects, I think it was a red ball and a green ball, and they were just basically told to go and catch each other. So one would run, the other would chase. And as they added objects into that environment, so for example, a wall, something to hide behind, something to be on top of, the objects learned that they could, the red and the green ball learned that they could use those objects to either hide more effectively or push them out the way. It's very fascinating how it all works. That comes out of the need and the knowledge which is developed. But then comes the question of, why would they need that impetus? Why would they need to actually move forward? And that's where the difference is between computers and people. We have a base need, computers don't. 
So there are three main components to AI, which you should pay attention to. Math, computer vision, and natural language processing. If you look at the original um, definition that we had of artificial intelligence, it mentions all three of these components. And the reason that I bring math into here is because, as was pointed out by one of my friends who's an actuary, mathematics is a language unto itself when you understand it on that higher level. You know, the ABC, square, blah, all that kind of stuff. By looking at that and by factoring it in against what computers are. And remember, computers have all started off from the concept of binary, binary being the ones and the zeros. If I break that down further, it's literally on off. So on off, on off, on off creates your circuit that then creates the action. And if you think about it in a very roundabout way, relates back to those schemas and the developments in the development psychology and the way that artificial intelligence also develops itself. We see how this all plays together. So the math aspect of AI looks at the probability. And for example, if it is a beautiful sunny day in London, it's nice warm weather, okay, that's one aspect. Um, it is a Saturday, another aspect. Um, it is a family with a child, third aspect. And it's the afternoon, fourth aspect, after lunchtime. The probability of someone having an ice cream becomes very high. That same kind of math is used. That's a very basic and simplistic example, I do understand. But if you look at that probability and that ratio, that's what's used within the math component of AI. So it's looking at if I do task A, B, C, D, my outcome it becomes E, F, G. And the more that that outcome is proved and recognized and chosen, the more that that outcome becomes the chosen outcome, which means that it becomes the dominant trait or predominant schema. Looking at computer vision, this is the ability to process graphics and visuals. So in videos in what we call Nerf technology, the pixelation of things and um, putting it all together. In essence, it's the computer's ability to recognize in a very weird way, pieces of a puzzle and put them together and realize what they are. So human faces, if the person is smiling or frowning, you can engage sentiment, the person happy or sad, various things like that. And then finally, third aspect of artificial intelligence is language processing, but specifically going to natural language processing. So it's not just defining words, um, you know, one is ein in German, it's things like that. It's looking at the context of the word as well. That's why it's natural language processing. So in the English language, as you would know, we have the word capital. So capital can refer to two different things. It can refer to a country or it can refer to financial. The reason that this is important in being able to understand the context of the word and the natural language of it is because you can then associate documentation appropriately and actually move it forward. Okay, so here are some of the case studies within AI. This was a cold case that we worked on um, just with regards to the information processing. So here we've got Azure Cognitive Search, we've got facial, facial recognition, we've got text services. All of these components were used against some 500,000 documents. Now the documents in this case weren't just Word documents. They're also handwritten. They could be in different kinds of um, written text, different formats, cursive, printed, uh, typed. You've then also got the ability to recognize images, so photos of people at this point in time. So if you have a situation where you've got a photo of a person and the person is labeled as Bob and it picks up this particular face and it goes through the cognitive search, goes through all the rest of the documents, and using that computer vision, finds another image of a person who matches the image of Bob, it can associate that Bob is in a, an additional image. And you start to look at the relationships and the relations that can be born. So in the second document, maybe it was a picture of a family. So now you can assume that Bob is part of the family, but Bob also knew person ABC. All those associations are what create the image of intelligence. But the question is, is it true intelligence? Which obviously it is not, it is artificial. 
this is a very good use case and example, but in the reality of it and in the real world, where you would use something like this is specifically in where we've had clients um, in legal firms in the UK for contract recognition and processing of information. So in the contract recognition sphere, what you often have is companies have got contracts that date back 10, 20, 30 years, whatever it might be. And in that time span, um, legislation has changed. Contracts have not necessarily all been updated. You know, a multinational would have thousands upon thousands of contracts. So in this case, for that particular client, what we did is we started to go through all of their documents and enrich the documents and work with the data to be able to extrapolate correctly and then pick up the associations. So in that case, there was contracts that needed to be renewed, re-signed, um, terms needed to be updated. And it could also pick up because of that linking, you know, maybe company A has got asset DEF, DHI, whatever it might be, and start to link things and entities together to create a more rounded picture. That creation of that picture is where AI is at this point in time, because it's building on the data and the raw information. And that's what makes this so exciting. That was a cold case. Here, this is a little bit more interesting. Uh, we're using the computer vision aspect. This was for smart risk prevention. So what we did is we created a zone, which you can see the gent walking through right now, using just normal cameras. Um, quality of the camera is going to depend on precisely what you're going to pick up. This is a very long wide shot, so it's going to pick up people moving. It's not necessarily going to pick up their facial expressions or sentiment analysis. But we can do sentiment analysis in a little bit later in the slides. This is interesting because you're picking up when people are entering areas that they shouldn't necessarily be in. So it can be used in a security type environment is one option. Um, and in the other option, it can tell you if a person has fallen or slipped or something like that. So in this use case, it was looking at specific areas. So you might even have a nuclear facility that would have something like this and have a warning system that goes on to say, you're entering a danger zone at this point in time, please leave. Etc. Um, if you've got a higher definition of camera, one of the things that we have also worked on is for a retirement facility where we were looking at fall analysis, which can also be used in factories and places like that, parks, wherever it might be. And if people don't have the ability to call for help, the video that's being processed would automatically pick up that someone has fallen. It'll check if they're moving and then it'll notify step A, B, C, D. And with the way that AI is currently working and new technologies available, you could even potentially program it to phone and call into 999 and actually speak to a person and be able to tell them everything that is happening. So um, my colleague has fallen. They are at this place address, this vector, whatever it might be, that they are not moving and they can actually report it back. There is also just for interest sake, a very interesting um, AI chatbot that was utilized for making a reservation for, um, I think it was a hairdressing appointment. It's fascinating. It even has the ability to go um and ah uh, and really play in a lifelike way with the person on the other side. Okay. Here we used customer tracking. This is also going into the computer vision side of things. This is looking at sentiment. So we have a store. We've had this with um, petrol stations and forecourts where you are processing the data and the information that is coming in. And you can then gauge the sentiment of the people as they're walking through the store. You can use that for layout, for design, for whatever you would like to. You could technically use it in an HR type situation where you want to see if your staff are happy, if your staff are sad. Um, an interesting use case, potentially. That facial recognition allows you to track the customer. As I said, store layout specifically, it would also, dependent on where the um, cameras are, be able to pick up where on the shelf an object should be placed, how it ties into a specific demographic. There are 
multiple options available. The sky is kind of technically the limit, but budgets also play limits in what can be done. As we progress further, and one of the conversations I was having recently was about computer power. And that's one of the reasons that AI is now becoming more prevalent because as we said at the beginning of the conversation, this is math orientated. So you've got algorithms and computations which need to be executed in order for things to actually happen. And they require a large amount of computer capability. As we go forward as people and with technology, and we start to look at the ability to change over to quantum computing, where the processing power is exponentially higher. So we will create the ability to push and manipulate and work with data and enrich it and to look at those associations. Here we're moving on to something called point cloud and to scanning. So this is chosen because it's Lyon Cathedral. Um, it was done for construction real estate. This is just an experiment that we did showing you the scanning of the cathedral. Uh, we created, I think it was 6 million points of scan on the image. This was done with a Leica lens and you will see shortly, Spot the robotic dog. The reason that we use Spot in this particular situation is he's got the ability to properly grid a space. So unlike a human who might walk, you know, 10 centimeters to the side or five inches to the left or whatever it might be, Spot really knows how to walk up and down in straight lines and scan everything. So here what we're doing is a digital overlay. You see all the different points that were created for the cathedral. You could go through it in and out. Um, I think the images were taken from 100 meters away. And what's fascinating is that there's less than a three millimeter margin of error. The comprehension of that much detail taken from so far away and preserving something for ever in essence. This is what you would call a digital twin. So it's an absolute replica of what is currently out there. The AI components of this is in overlaying those pictures and making sure that they all map together. So in a way, similar to a puzzle, you've got one pixel, which has got to align to the next pixel and everything's got to match perfectly. It would take humans forever to do something like this, being 6 million points, imagine that for a puzzle, but done by AI and using that compute power once again, you've got a much better chance of everything. So here, this is Aerogene, our graphic engine that we've created. Some of the programs that we've worked on, 3D design, um, AI, as we move forward, we've worked with some very interesting customers. We developed the engine um, in order to be able to render in 3D graphic because of the requirements. And here's where it gets important on the AI aspect, because of their compute power, and because of the way that everything is set up, you need to make sure that you take these huge files and compress them correctly, but you can't lose any data or information when you do so. So here you'll see we're doing scanning of engines. Um, another thing that we managed to do with this is maintenance, predictive maintenance. Um, also an interesting one was using MRIs to create a 3D render of the person to be able to look at where the best place to insert or cut would be with regards to tumor removal, et cetera. So this is where you have the good side of AI and machine learning, and you have the good side of graphics because you are helping and you're creating a better way of doing things. And that's what we should all focus on. So going a little bit further, this is a point cloud. So the same as the cathedral in essence, um, what you're going to see here is all these different points. And then as the AI machine goes through it and learns what is what, it starts to um, establish various objects within that cluster. You can see it pulling through. This is the piping within a manufacturing facility, which will also be displayed in the next slide. Here you can see we're looking at particularly a valve. So there's a few different ways to be able to recognize that valve. One is human intervention, as in the AI component goes through the image and picks up something which it associates as being an image. It'll then bring it up to the human 
or person, and they will type in this is a valve. And the machine has now learned that this particular cluster of pixels in its formation represents a valve, and it can then look at everything else within that scan and compare it. So what will happen, I'm not too sure if it does in this particular graphic, is you'll be able to pick up additional valves that are within that area. So where this gets more interesting is you've now picked it up. So you can label the valve as it's a Siemens valve, perhaps. Let's call it a Siemens valve. And you've got one officially. And you go through your entire portfolio of assets that you have, and you render these scans through. And it picks up all the other valves at the same time. It label them correctly. And then perhaps in 20 years' time, there's a recall on valves or maybe five years because the valve turns out that it's not going to last its lifetime of 50 years and they've got to be changed over. This would give you the ability to be in one place and see where you're in your entire portfolio, these valves rest and then plan your maintenance accordingly and be able to actually go and do the maintenance and pull forward. Here you can see that same layout and here's where it's picking up the additional items this is where you're looking at iot so internet of things this is using sensors so it's sensing how hot or cold something is in this particular situation and there's the secondary valve and because this is a point cloud it gives you a 3d type render so you've got the ability to turn and twist the image and here you've got the ability to start recognizing additional items within that structure so the steel elbow the steel valve secondary valve main pipe whatever it might be. The AI components of this is what's actually pushing everything forward because the computer is learning what is what and it's moving it forward. So here you could, for example, decide that things need to be fixed, repaired, changed over. If you wanted to go into new and more interesting technology, you've got the potential to have this rendered into virtual reality so you could have a technician going on site and the virtual reality is going to pick up the item and guide them to it um, you could even go so far not quite yet but it is moving that way to having a junior engineer for example with virtual reality goggles on fixing an object and being instructed by a senior engineer who actually knows what they're doing properly and they could be anywhere in the world that becomes interesting because for specifically in manufacturing, you often have manufacturing concerns that have um, machines which can only be fixed by very specific people. This takes away the necessity to actually fly that person out or aspects such as that. Oh, this is a lot. Okay, so let's discuss natural language processing so what's come out a lot these days and i hope everyone has tried it is chat gpt is it this magical thing that everyone just is amazed by chat gpt is technically natural language progressive processing at its best what it's done here is it's got a huge reference library that has been configured and enriched so the easiest way to think about that is think about an old school library you know, if you were lucky enough to go to university, one of those ones that's like five stories, or if you've been to the British Museum and seen their beautiful library, it is truly beautiful, in my opinion. Um, you've got all these books with all this information in it, but unless you've read through all of those books yourself, you don't know what's in there. So you need to be able to label those books appropriately. So back in the old days, I am that old, unfortunately, um, we had catalog cards, which were in the library and if you wanted to go look up something you would then go through the catalog cards and it would reference this book here this book here this book here that is the beginning of data enrichment so and that's where ai currently stands it's got the ability to process these huge amounts of data and compute them and enrich itself from them this is just done by machine learning models as they get applied that's the reason why so in the US, one of the things which they've been trying to use ChatGPT for, and the question is, will ChatGPT become a lawyer or have the ability to actually legally argue? In certain aspects, yes, because 
lawyers aren't like in the movies or television. Um, they simply make state, they, they follow tried and true legislation and law and sequences. So, you know, if you are arrested for robbery, there's certain responses that they have to have, there's certain paperwork that they need to fill out. That can all technically be done as a basic. So is ChatGPT magic? Well, let's have a look at one of the examples that we've created. Uh, this was just to sell a little three bedroom house, two bathroom. So you'll see here, stunning three bedroom, two bathroom house in Reading. Note the word stunning, three bedroom, two bathroom. Okay, great. What's happened here, I can tell you about the back end of this or uh, I try and explain it to you, is you would have had multiple people asking and querying the database about how to write something like this, a hundred word advert for a three bedroom, two bathroom house. Um, as the first person did it, they would have then said, oh, can you just rejig this and um, chat GPT will then rejig it and rewrite it. And they might rewrite it two or three times and that person selects option C. Okay, and the next time the chat GPT does it, it says, okay, well, option C was the best one because a person selected it first. So we'll put option C as the first option and we'll see if the next person who's busy asking the same question wants us to rewrite it. Next person chooses the first option given to them, which in this case was the word with was the one with the word stunning in it. That then translates to become the better selection for chat GPT to go for. And that's how it works. So chat GPT is constantly testing itself and seeing if the wording that it's using is correct and seeing the reaction to it. And it's gaining knowledge from your reaction, so your selection. And by doing that, it gauges sentiment. Now you can actually go further and look at ChatGPT and the AI analytics behind it. And you can start to define by ge geographical region, demographic, person, um, age, etc. So here's an example of a three bedroom, two bathroom house in Reading being sold to a young boy. Hey there, young man, are you looking for a new home to call your own? Do we see how the tone and everything has changed? Now, you could argue that the reason the tone has changed is because the computer is gaining knowledge and becoming intelligent unto itself. But the reality is within the information bank that the computer has, or that ChatGPT has in this case, there will be an information storage on how to speak to children, or there will be an associated Judy Bloom book or Harry Potter book or whatever it might be, where that language and syntax which is utilized for speaking to a younger generation is very present. So the AI can ascertain and pick up that using specific words would tie into a specific audience, as can be seen with the example for targeting a four-year-old girl. Calling all little princesses, that's not because ChatGPT is clever enough to do what it's doing, it's because it's seen it somewhere else and it's mimicking that behavior. So as fascinating and amazing as ChatGPT is, you must remember that it is just a computer and computers can only do what they are told. So something has told it what to do. It's not sentient, which is the big difference that people often confuse between artificial intelligence and real intelligence and motivation is that sentient nature and behavior. And on that note, um, thank you very much for your time. I hope that you've enjoyed some of the examples that we've discussed and the applications that AI can be used in. For the simplicity of it, um, you're looking at your chat functionality, your natural language processing, computer vision, and mathematic and the relationship behind everything. So I hope you enjoyed that and thank you very much for your time. And I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Rudolfo, who will go through these four questions that we have. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank Rudolfo. you very much. Thank you very much, James. Great presentation. So we can start with this question and answering section of the workshop. And we already have uh, so many questions here. So <laughs> let me pick up. One question for you. So I think that this one might be interesting. And it says something like how we can start using AI in business, right? Because James was explaining all the capabilities of this technology. So 
we are all, I assume, exciting to, to start to use in that, right? So <clears throat> before doing that, we need to understand that there are, you know, this kind of uh, maturity assessment in AI within a company, right? So uh, if we are starting to use AI in our business, we are in this kind of level one foundational, right? Um, this where we are questioning, okay, what is um, what AI is and how uh, can uh, we apply it to, to our business, how we can improve on, on or automate things, right? So that's the, the level one. And this maturity uh, level assessment goes all the way up to the level five, which is the final level where, where you company will be, you know, the AI will be part of your business DNA and you're, you are fully within the uh, um, AI. So starting with this uh, foundational um, level one, um, we think the best way to do it is to try to, to, to put in place a successful AI strategy. So how we implement a strategy on, on AI, right? So um, we think to, to achieve that, we need to align the objective objectives of our, of our companies uh, with the AI vision, right? So trying to identify use cases. Uh, those use cases should be clearly then defined uh, with a narrow scope, uh, with a, a clear requirements. And also we need to pay attention to those enabling factors like, okay, uh, where do I have my uh, data? Do I have enough data to do this? Uh, what are the benefits of putting this POC, running this POC about automating certain things for my company, right? So once you have identified the potential use cases, you kind of start on thinking on, okay, we are going to start the small, we're, we're going to prove the technology, we are going to see the requirements we need, and after that, after this uh, um, proof of concept, we can move to another, you know, um, stages in the uh, looking for another use cases, or maybe trying to roll out more powerful um, functionalities to be able to integrate the technology in our, you know, business. So if well, that technology that you would integrate into the business um, would be any aspect that you want to look at potentially automating. So for example, um, filling out forms, pulling information in, using an AI bot. We have a client currently who requires forms that are filled out in, in a very specific way. So instead of having a person having to go through, in this case, um, submitting a passport photo, that's got to be correct. It's got to be, you know, five centimeters up, down, wherever it might be. The AI will be able to look at the image which the customer has submitted and respond back to them saying, you're not allowed to smile, please retake your image. Or you are wearing glasses, please take your glasses off for the image. It can pick up these aspects. And of course, as it sees more and more images, it can give more and more detail and have less mistakes. So a funny mistake would be if it's looking at a person and going, please don't smile. And the person just happens to have a double chin. Who knows what it might be? But that's what the aspect of AI would be. You could use it for predictive maintenance. You've got a whole host of things that you can potentially use AI for. But as Rodolfo was pointing out, everything comes down to that baseline again, which is the information, the data that you have. If you don't have much information or data, you can't base your system on anything. Okay. Um, one of the other questions, Rodolfo, would you like to go to the next one? Yeah, of course. Thank you for, thank you for clarifying the, um, I'm completing the, uh, the answer. Yeah, um, we have here another question uh, which is about the ethical considerations that, should, uh, that business should be considered or take into account, right? When we are trying to integrate these uh, technologies. So I think that's a, a great question, great question. Um, 
<clears throat> I, I think it's related with another one um, um, related with this um, use case you you were showing before James about this um, tracking uh, customer tracking within a, a, a shop right so <clears throat> I think that's a, a very important question and is uh, at the moment managed by the main AI providers right now, like Microsoft. So this question about ethics and um, privacy, data privacy are, you know, were very well known. And from our point of view, like, you know, we are a business and we uh, want to make sure that we are aligned with these, uh, you know, ethical questions and data, data privacy. So I think it's important to pay attention to transparency. So, you, you know, you know, we, transparency, James, you were, were, were about to. Oh, yes, no, I just wanted to point out here that yeah. in regard to GDPR, as much as we all think that GDPR is this legislation which protects everyone, technically what it does is it protects the individual, right? So it protects your name and mobile number getting sent out there. But with regards to any data that is gathered, while you are out and about. For example, um, tracking of vehicles, looking at the Bluetooth, which is broadcast from your radio. That's picked up when you drive past any traffic lights within most modern countries. So it can look at where a vehicle is moving, um, how many vehicles are passing. It doesn't necessarily have to track the vehicle, but it can say that on this particular traffic roundabout, there are 500 vehicles passing per hour we then use that data and extrapolate and say that we need to create a four lane road as opposed to a two lane road, whatever might be required there. That's the GDPR. In this particular case, what um, Cecilio asked, thank you very much for the question, Cecilio, is GDPR regulations with customer tracking and also the ethical considerations. So with the customer tracking, you're tracking anonymized data. You're not tracking me, James, you're tracking uh, your old male um walking through a section in the store and looking up at the fishing gear you're not tracking me personally so because of that differential you're not going over the gdpr laws and the legislation because at the end of the day the store that you're walking through technically it is their premises and technically it is your option and decision to actually walk through that store or be not go into it and that's where it stops as far as the legislation is concerned. They can gather data on you. I mean, companies work on data. Uh, there was a very interesting analysis that I was reading with regards to Facebook. And the person pointed out, if something is free, somebody's got to pay for it somewhere. And if somebody's paying for it somewhere, there's a value to it. And if you look at something like social media, it's free, okay? which means there's a commodity at trade. And the commodity at trade in this particular situation is us. It's data, it's the way that we use it, integrate it, sales that can come from it, or the way that you can use it going forward. So once again, like I said, with AI, it's good and bad. So in the analysis of people's traffic habits, um, the good is you could potentially prove that you need to have better crossing times, you need to have a bigger road infrastructure, things like that. Don't really see the negative to tracking cars. Well, other than if it was publicly available information and you were going places you shouldn't be going, like the bakery when you're on a diet, Wait Watchers could track you, whatever it might be. You've got to use your imagination here. Um, with regards to the ethical considerations that a business should take into account when integrating artificial intelligence into their operations, it's all going to depend on what the business wants. So good and bad. Good from the aspect that you could potentially take jobs and tasks which are currently mundane and being performed by people within your organization, take them away, allow them to be automated in process, and then redeploy those people and utilize them in more profit oriented or more customer centric um, aspects of the business and therefore build your business up and strengthen it. But what I can see happening on the other side of things is using AI and robotics to try and replace people. That is where I, from my personal aspect, 
ethically will argue against it because the objective is not to outskill and rid yourself. The objective is to upskill and build yourself. But unfortunately, in the society that we live in, and because people are generally money grabbing, this is just one of the things that we unfortunately will be dealing with in life going, for going forward. It's unfortunately a reality. But hopefully, the large companies who are trying to establish these rules will look towards trying to protect people. The reality is it's a big company. And in my personal opinion, and I do not speak for, this is just my opinion, and looking at everything that I've looked at, large companies will generally favor themselves when looking at how to deploy something. Once again, I state, you are the product that they are currently selling. So everything that they do is going to work towards that. We just have to, on our side, look at what is going to be best for us. Uh, let me just go through these. Rudolfo, do you have any others that you want to address? I think you, you cover perfectly well this um, uh, question. So we have more questions here. So maybe we can, we can um, you know, try to answer this one related with the use of chat GPT for answers. And there is a question about the risk of exposing um, the information, right? Your information when you are using chat GPT. Um, and it's a, for instance, I ask it to analyze the sales performance of my company. Would the sales figures be given to others? So <clears throat> I think at the moment um, we need to pay attention to that because all data you provide to ChatGPT could be, um, you know, um, re revised, so to speak, by humans, uh, because there is this kind of process of validation of the feedback and, you know, how um, ChatGPT is being used. So there are people behind trying to see how well or not is performing ChatGPT. So, in fact, I think OpenAI, which is the company company providing these services, and they already um, say that, right? So, so if you are going to use this service, please notice that your information, the information you are providing, could be, you know, um, used or, or read by 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 people, other people. Which comes so, down to that concept that we are once again the commodity and everything. So um, no, yeah. do not use it and actually input your sales figures from your company because exactly. that's information that they won't necessarily sell going, Bob from Lloyd's Bank has just inputted all the salaries from well, the directorate. They would sell it as this is what directors of banks have. They wouldn't recognize you as Bob and sell it just maliciously, but mm -hmm. you are giving them the data and the information. So potentially what they could do is use that information in understanding how the share price of Lloyd's could be affected by the salaries which are getting taken, or they could understand that the directors have gotten X, Y, and Z bonuses. And because the directors have got these bonuses, they can infer that the company is doing well because bonuses are associated with um, the capabilities of the business. So yes, uh, you are at risk. I would not do it. I wouldn't recommend it, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, using chat GPT is worthwhile in marketing communications department, despite the fact that it does not have emotional intelligence. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head there. So yes, chat GPT is not sentient. It's not going to pick up things like humans do. Um, it can relay a lot of information in a very similar tone. But as we were looking at the example of selling to a four-year-old girl, the, the house example, um, it's only picking that up because of a book and association that it's made in the past. Nine times out of 10, that will actually work. So yes, ChatGPT could be used in a customer care or marketing department quite effectively. Um, test it out for yourself. Ask it questions. Maybe don't, don't provide it with all the detail, um, but you certainly can ask it, how would I sell my home? How would I sell a motorcycle? How would I target selling puppets to children? Whatever it might be, it'll have information, it'll be able to help you. Um, I don't think 
that it's going to be at this point in time with its capabilities have the actual ability to negotiate with you and give you the perfect answer but it will certainly help you down the line as far as really getting you there so yes marketing at the end of the day marketing is in my opinion one of the dark arts i practice it on a regular regular basis um and it's something which we all have to do it's it's sales it's the way that the world works you need to be able to sell something to be able to get your commodity to be able to get your money in etc where the commodity in certain instances other instances commodities are commodities whatever it might be in this instance um information is the commodity of information technology it's the main thing that we all work with it's what ai works with it's what machine learning works with it's what chat gpt works with interesting side note chat gpt i think the database for it is only up until 2021 so in theory any additional questions that relate to the most recent months would not necessarily come back with a true answer once again that comes down to the quality of the data what's behind it how it infers how it interacts that's what you need to look at you need to look at your data journey you need to see where you're going to be able to utilize this and you need to be aware of the double edge of the sword it's got benefits it has negativity the whole objective of this particular presentation was to impart that knowledge to you um, I didn't want to go too technical in it I, that's why we got Rodolfo because he's very good at his technical stuff um, I wanted to go through a lot of theory about it and how it all acts interacts and works but yes um, I do believe we're done with question no we're not yes <laughs> okay I, I think honest <laughs> I think you you provide a, a very good answer um also we have here uh, another question which is about the you know from the business per perspective um from our own experience right what are the AI main challenges so uh, we can have uh, several right like biases in algorithms lack of talent uh, maybe a technology gap or quality quality of, of data or ethical implications and how could these uh, challenges be overcome so um i know i don't know james if you agree with me but um, i think uh, data quality most of the time is the, the most uh, challenging question because um, business want to uh, integrate ai in their processes to to get the value right and sometimes <clears throat> they see the potential of the technology and maybe they think that uh, that potential could be achieved without historical data for instance right if we're trying to make some kind of predictions about uh, the data so so for i think for me <clears throat> in my experience or in our experience the lack of quality data is one of the of the um, the main challenge for 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 business um but there are other several others when you are trying to to start working with ai right like for instance uh, you already did a proof of concept um but maybe it's um isolated uh, use case and is not uh, providing so much value to the to the business so this is the reason why we need to to uh, select carefully the use cases we are going to to start right and maybe you select the use case correctly but you can maybe um, bump into difficulties to scale the use case from the pilot to the production environment or you don't have the internal resources resources to and capabilities to implement ai use cases so that's when uh, companies were like us uh, we are going to to help right um of course the the maybe the lack of investment in in ai or data infrastructure uh, with a clear in 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 the standing understanding of the uh, what are the applications the use cases etc right so there are like i said several challenges um i think um the the one about uh lack of talent um is, is not the case 
James? I think lack of talent is actually a, an issue at this point in time within the IT market um, because to find developers and to find the right people can be very challenging. Um, I know that, for example, in Python programming, which is, I took one look at it for approximately 20 seconds and then throw that away because it's very complex and very difficult to understand for normal people. Um, it's, it's a challenge and a lot of people have gone into it and they just kind of structure something together, but they don't necessarily follow the structure and actually say how they got to these results. And because it's an AI and machine learning model, you often have a situation where you get a result from telling it to do something, but you don't, and you get result number three is the correct result that you want. And then result number seven, eight, nine, and 10 are all going horribly wrong. If you haven't installed the necessary tracking within that structure, you can't figure out which term and which search criteria and information processing mode is actually the one that you want. And that's something which can only be learned as you are going through all the various um, topics. But on that note, you have my details. Um, I am aware of time and I wanted to just say to everyone, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for the questions that you've asked. Um, I hope that we've managed to give you a bit of a nice outlook onto the use of AI within a business environment where it can be put into place. Um, I hope that I've imparted to you that it's not something to be scared of. It's something that can really be used to your advantage, but you need to pay attention to it like everything, it's like driving a car. It's fantastic to be able to drive around, but if you're going to drive drunk and not actually know what you're doing, eh, maybe don't. So yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, my details are available, james.bando.planeconcepts.com. And if you want, you can gladly get in touch with Rebecca from the Spanish Chamber. I'm sure she'll be able to put you onto the right people. And thank you once again, Rodolfo, for answering those questions for us and giving us some technical insights. And thank, thank you. you so much, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you, James, just to mirror your words. And thank you, everyone, for asking those questions and, and putting them into the chat function. And thank you, uh, Rodolfo, for stepping in as well and, and addressing those. Um, as James just mentioned, any further questions, um, please do feel free to contact him directly. Um, his email is there, you can see on your screen, um, but I will be sharing uh, following this session his contact details as well um, and that of pain concepts in general. So please do feel free to, to get in touch with them um, if, if there's anything else that you'd like to, to ask about. Um, I will also be sharing the, the recording for this session. So if there's anybody else that you think might benefit from, from uh, the knowledge that was shared, um, please feel free to, to pass on the link. Um, it will also be uploaded to the Chamber's YouTube channel along with recordings and highlights from any of our um, past uh, events. Um, just to, to end today's session with a, a thank you to, to both of you, James uh, Rodolfo and Plain Concepts um, for, for sharing all of this information with us. Um, I think it's been fantastic and, and really, really useful. So thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, please do keep your eyes peeled on our events uh, calendar. Um, we're, we're pretty busy, so it's, you know, um, a great chance for you to come along and, and see uh, the other types of events that we hold at the Chamber. Um, next week in particular, we have a business breakfast with uh, the Minister for Technology, um, Paul Scully MP, um, that will be at the Malia White House Hotel. Um, that event is free for members of the Chamber, so if you're able to join us, please do. Um, I would suggest registering quickly for that one because spaces are limited, um, but it should be uh, another fantastic session. Um, that's everything for today. I do believe I have a hand raised, so I'm just going to, to quickly, let me just, there we go, I think. Igor, yeah. We have a hand raised, I'm not sure. If Perhaps not. Okay, no problem. Um, all right, well, that that's everything. Oh, he's unmuted now. There you go. I'm not sure if he's struggling to... Okay. Well, 
Okay. Um, well, no, thank you. Thank you again. That, that's everything from, from us. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye.